Good morning and welcome to Global Healthcast, brought to you by Global Health Press. In this podcast series, once a week, we bring to you news and views about vaccines and vaccination. I am Joe Schmidt, and with me is Dr. Melvin Senecas. Good morning, Melvin. Good morning, Professor, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to those who are watching us today. Today, we bring to you what's to know about the Aries variant, what to do if you catch COVID today, unusual dengue surge in Bangladesh, and we go on with our vaccination and pregnancy series today on influenza. Melvin, you start with dengue as always. What is the EG5 variant? Yes, uh, we start with COVID, and this is the Aries variant that's been talked about now. Um, it is a an Omicron subvariant, and really, at the moment, there is no reason to expect that it can cause a huge surge of COVID. Um, there are others at the moment who are also um, increasing in numbers, uh, other variants, other subvariants, um, but it seems like um, they are not really as concerning. That's why they're not called variants of concern. So this EG.5 is at the moment a variant of interest. This is lower than the variant under monitoring, uh, no, lo lower than the variant of concern. And in early July, this was called a variant under monitoring. So there are three levels, right? So we have variant of concern, variant of interest, variant under monitoring. So now it's a variant of interest. And that's why we have it here. So if that's you hear the name, you know all about it. And Aries is a name that virologists gave to this variant, right? It is it is just a laboratory name or a, a what do you say, um, um, uh, every day's name, right? Nothing, nothing yes. science. It, it's not it's not an official name. So basically, uh, a virologist on Twitter called it Aries from the Greek goddess of strife and discord. Basically. Oh my, yeah, oh my God. <laughs> Very good. Um, and you have another slide on what to do when you catch COVID-19. And actually you hear, I'm a little hoarse, maybe I have COVID. So what is your advice? Yes, so we've been getting a lot of questions on um, what to do when you have COVID now. So just to put this into context, we are in a different situation, right? It's compared to 2020, 2021, even 2022. Um, we have vaccines now. Um, we have the boosters that are updated. We have some treatments for COVID. And we sort of know how to manage patients now. So I think it's important to tell people that if you are, if you have symptoms now, um, and if you are high risk, so let's say you are an older population, you are immunocompromised, it's, it's really important to get tested to, to know whether you have COVID or not. And if you, have, if you test positive, of course, you stay at home, you isolate and notify your contacts to tell them that you have COVID, just to also give them an idea that they should also stay home if they, they test positive, right? And if you are at high risk, Consider treatment. We have, for example, Paxlovid that has been shown to really significantly reduce your risk of being hospitalized or dying if you are high risk. And of course, the other advice that we have here is the usual that you do when you have fever. Drink plenty of fluids, use over-the-counter anti-fever medications if, it, if, if necessary. And if you start to experience severe symptoms like difficulty of breathing, chest pain, it's important to really seek medical care immediately because, of course, your family physician, they would know better how to manage you and your chronic medical conditions, right? Yeah. Look, for more and more respiratory tract infections, we now have vaccines and treatments. We can treat and prevent influenza. And now we have uh, COVID, we can treat and we can prevent it. Uh, for RSV, there are now several vaccines upcoming, including vaccines for pregnant women and uh, vaccines for the elderly, maybe in the future also for toddlers and uh, infants. 
So this is this is all coming along, and I guess we need to know more about these respiratory tract infections. And uh, now, I guess COVID is in the focus, right? And don't forget, it is still around, and autumn is coming. And uh, if you're a risk person, uh, make sure you know what you are sick from. I guess that's the main message, right? Yes, and and, and again, um, also to remind people that there are other things that you can do to modify your risk. Uh, for example, when you exercise regularly, this has been shown to really reduce your chances of getting severe COVID. If you exercise regularly, if you eat well, and all these things to keep your body healthy. Yeah, very good. Melvin, you have another story. You discovered something in Bangladesh. Yes, so the reason why I added this here is because I think um, this is important for people to know that there is an unusual dengue surge in Bangladesh at the moment. Um, this high incidence of dengue is taking place in the context of uh, unusual episodic amount of rainfall combined with high temperatures and high humidity. So there is a, um, a link to the climate crisis. And this, all of these factors have resulted in an increased mosquito population throughout Bangladesh. If you can see here, um, uh, you will notice that the 2000, that the 2023 um, surge is very different from the past years, 2019, 2021, 2022. And this is really um, bothering and concerning public health officials in Bangladesh because they, they have recorded the most number of dengue cases since um, they, they have started recording dengue cases in, in Bangladesh. And um, to look, of course, they have been advising people to really um, do something about mosquito control, but it, it seems like because of the heavy rainfall and the really high density of mosquito population, it's, it's not as effective as they, they want it to be. So probably several factors come together. It's rainy season. Uh, there has been a lot of rainfall due to climate change, I guess, and uh, it gets warmer, so mosquitoes can breed more, and then they have this outbreak here. So very interesting. Actually, what I want to ask um, Melvin is: this uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever? I mean, it must be severe dengue, right? Not uh, not a little bit of fever. This must be severe cases, right? Yes, yes, and 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 of course, if you compare the the cases of just dengue and the, the, the hemorrhagic fever. There are more cases of dengue, right, that are not as serious, yeah. but people have died as well in, in Bangladesh in this past uh, six or seven months of 2023, and that is concerning for the public health officials. Yeah, it is really amazing how this is popping up here. Very interesting. Melvin, I have, I'm covering a little bit again our uh, um, observing how well countries are doing with regard to vaccination. And I came across this paper that was only published uh, this year, but it's data from 2006-2014. And again, it is my congratulation to the UK for their wonderful uh, for their for their wonderful um, system of uh, vaccination and vaccine uptake, what they show us here. Here they have the density of DTP vaccine doses, and you see dose one, two, and three, and this is dose four. Now dose four seems to be low, but uh, again the peak is lower because uh, it is the, the the amount of vaccinations is given is spreading over a little bit more time. So if you spread it, the peak is lower, right? But you see nice data here. DTP is getting done. This is uh, PCV, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, and this is measles, mumps, rubella. And then you can see completeness of uh, vaccination, and actually this is compliance, and you can also see completion, and you see here on-time vaccinations here. This is the uh, reddish, uh, brownish part, and the vaccines not given is the yellow part here at the bottom. So this is very good data altogether to show that vaccine uptake in the United Kingdom is quite high. It is delayed, and the later doses are always given a little bit too late. So maybe in the future, recommending bodies should recommend that vaccines are given more early, and then they are delayed, and then you have what you want. I don't know, too. But uh, 
it, it is really just nice that they have this data. And I wouldn't know any country in the world that would have that on a population basis, really. So again, congratulations to the UK for their vaccination system. Any views from you, Melvin? Any thoughts? You know, I, it, the UK is really very um, admirable in terms of surveillance. I, I think even with COVID, they, they had the best data. Even with the variants, they have the best data as well. So, yeah, I, I have to agree with that. Yeah. Let's continue with um, vaccination pregnancy, VIP. Very often people speak about maternal vaccination, which is not quite correct because mothers should be vaccinated anyway. There is nothing special. If you have a child, so three years of age, you're a mother and you should get all the regular vaccines, right? Independent of the age of your child. What is really coming up now more as a concept is vaccination and pregnancy, and I call it VIP. It is not a new concept. In 1960, after many pregnant women died in the 1957-58 pandemic, the Surgeon General in the US recommended influenza vaccine for pregnant individuals. And that, again, is now 60 years old, this recommendation. And this has then been endorsed and has been extended a little by, by the recommending body, by the NITEC, by ACIP in the United States. They also recommended Tdap booster 2006, and lately they recommended um, COVID vaccination during the pandemic for pregnant women. I want to make very clear that there is a difference here between recommendations and license. No vaccine to date is licensed for use in pregnancy, but no vaccine today is licensed for obese people, for people with blonde hair or for whatever the characteristic you may have. You can use it if you're pregnant and it is recommended for pregnancy. But again, there is no license. It's not on the label of the vaccine that it should be used during pregnancy. So this is the difference here. Now, what is the data that you can use it? And uh, number one, in the past, we vaccinated uh, people 65 plus, people with chronic health, with chronic underlying diseases. Now it is during pregnancy, and I show you a little bit of the benefits. The one thing to remember is you must not use the live intranasal vaccine. That is not indicated during pregnancy because it's a live vaccine. In any event, pregnant women die of influenza from pneumonia. The unborn may there may be stillbirth, low birth rate, or premature births. And then if the infant gets pneumonia, gets, gets influenza, it may come down with pneumonia, it may be hospitalized or even die. So this is why there is a benefit from uh, vaccination against influenza during pregnancy. Let's look a little bit about the vaccines out there. And I want to start with the efficacy of influenza vaccine, or actually the effectiveness in a general population. So depending on the year and the, the area where you look at, and then depending also on the, um, on the study sites and other variables, vaccine efficacy or effectiveness is between 10 and 60%. Let's say roughly 40, 50%. That is in a general population. Again, uh, very importantly, if you take another endpoint, which is hospitalization or death, efficacy would be higher. But this is, again, a general population. This is uh, uh, microbiologically confirmed influenza. Now here, influenza vaccine efficacy, uh, when you vaccinate pregnant women in a meta-analysis, you see, number one, the risk is reduced for the infant in different papers. And here, pregnant women, the same, even more reduction of disease. Pregnant women are protected from influenza, and so are their children after birth. You see at the same time, there is no safety concern, fetal death, premature death, low birth weight, small for gestational age. There is, the risk is always around one, which means there is no risk, right? It is the, in the vaccinated group as high as in the unvaccinated group. So there's nothing to worry about. And to summarize for the safety, there are many reviews of the topic 
And again, um, there was no concern with regard to abortion, uh, to neonatal or maternal death. Actually, there is a small benefit. Stillbirth, there is even a benefit. Prematurity, there is a small benefit. No congenital abnormalities that increase. Uh, small for gestational age, no increase. And low birth weight, there may be even a benefit. So this is very good data overall. And I guess this is what you always want to know for each disease that is vaccine preventable, the burden of disease of influenza in pregnant women and newborns and infants is high. Vaccine efficacy or effectiveness is good. It is not ideal, but it's all that we can do today. And there is an excellent safety profile to date after more than 60 years vaccinating pregnant women against influenza during pregnancy, any time during pregnancy, just before the season, there was no safety concern. I think this is great news and uh, do it. Melvin, what do you think? I, I think this is really uh, reassuring for, for pregnant women. Of course, for them, their concern is always, you know, will this vaccine somehow harm my baby or the fetus inside the body, right? And with all these 60 years or even more of, of data showing the benefit of the vaccine and the safety. Um, it, it's important to just remind people that there is data out there because mm -hmm. if you just Google influenza vaccine safety, you will really see a lot of bullshit out there. And mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's confusing people. Yeah. Actually, um, we come to that in a minute with our weekly cartoon, but uh, maybe I can summarize. You know now that there is an Aries variant, and uh, this is nothing special, and uh, there is nothing to worry about right now. Nothing changed, but you maybe you need to know. You should know the name if people speak about it. You should get tested if you're a risk person for COVID-19 infection. If you have a high risk coming to the hospital, having severe course, or making it to the intensive care unit. Um, Melvin uh, showed you data on a dengue surge in Bangladesh. And I covered vaccination and pregnancy, this time influenza. We will continue this uh, series on vaccination pregnancy in the future. Now, here is my cartoon of the week. This is Eratosthenes of Cyrene. He studied mathematics, geography. He was a poet. He was an astronomer. He invented things in music theory. He was the first to calculate that the circumference of the Earth and he could calculate uh, quite quite well. He found that there is an axial tilt of the globe. He uh, found the global projection of the world with parallels and meridians. He was the founder of scientific chronologies and he found a method of identifying prime numbers. More than 2,200 years ago, great guy. And this is Eratosthenes and here is Kevin. And Kevin at age 41 proved that more than 2,000 year old science is fake because in the internet he found that the earth is flat. Melvin, what do you think about Kevin? Well, um, Kevin is like many people out there, I, I think, who just believe whatever they read or see on the internet. And it's um, dangerous <laughs> and, and worrying. <laughs> Because yeah. of, if this trend is going to continue in, in the next couple of years and decades, I don't know what happened. I, I don't know what will happen to the world in 50 years. Yeah. Look, science is complicated and it's difficult to understand. The scientists over the last decades always tried to explain science. We are doing this. You and I, we do this every day. We tell it our friends and family. We have it on our podcast here. Uh, but some people simply do not understand how science works. And if they read some stupid things, then they think this is it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I guess uh, with this, we can finish our Global Health Class today. Thanks for joining us. We'll put our slides to the show notes. Join us again next week. I am Joe Schmidt. And with me was, as always, and thank you very much for watching. Stay safe.